Welcome to a Legendarium special about the history of werewolves. In this installment, we will talk about how werewolf lore has evolved from ancient times to the modern day. The werewolf is a mythological creature and the subject of many stories throughout the world. While there are many versions, the basic idea is that some people can transform into powerful and vicious animals. Asia has were tigers and were foxes, Africa has were hippos and hyenas, and South America has were jaguars. In Europe, the werewolf, meaning man wolf in Old English, reigned supreme. We do not know when such legends originated, but they date back to the Sumerian Epic of Gilgamesh, written over 4,000 years ago. In that story, the hero Gilgamesh leaves a potential lover because she transformed her previous man into a wolf, an obvious warning sign. These legends even found their way into Greek mythology, where a sorcerer named Lycaon enraged Zeus, king of the gods, by eating the remains of a young man he sacrificed. Zeus transformed Lycaon and his sons into wolves as punishment. The Romans also attributed magical powers to wolves. Legions from the Republican period carried wolf pelts upon wooden pillars, a practice that dated back to the early Romans' totemic religion. Werewolves also emerged in early Nordic folklore. The saga of the Volsungs tells the story of a father and son who discovered wolf pelts that had the power to transform people into wolves for ten days. The father-son duo put on the pelts, transformed into wolves, and went on a rampage in the forest. It ended when the father attacked and mortally wounded his son. The son only survived because a merciful raven gave the father a leaf with healing powers. After restoring his son, the father burned the pelts. Such beliefs about the power of wolf pelts found their way into Viking warfare as well. Infamous warriors called berserkers who made up the front line of Viking war bands wore wolf pelts in the belief that they gave them the ferocity and strength of the wolf. Some sources claimed that the berserkers could fight with spears in each hand, bite enemy shields, and snatch arrows in flight with their bare hands. Of course, such tales cannot be confirmed, but the Vikings' belief in wolf power undoubtedly gave them courage. So one can see that when Europe converted to Christianity during the 5th and 6th centuries, a belief in the totemic and transformative power of wolves already ran deep. The advent of Christianity did not change this. Early Christians often associated wolves with Satan, believing that they could fly in the air when no one watched and hypnotize people when their eyes turned red. Each region had their own variants of wolfish lore, most notably Scotland, where people believed that some persons lived in the cold ocean as seals, but came ashore as humans by hiding their pelts. Every region had their own version of werewolf lore. For example, the ways that a person could become a werewolf included drinking water from a wolf's paw print, sleeping under a full moon, or eating certain herbs, depending on where you asked people. But a common theme in medieval werewolf lore is people transforming at will by dressing in a wolf skin at night. Of course, they had to remove that pelt by daybreak and hide it. Before silver bullets came into vogue, one destroyed a werewolf by finding and burning their magical pelt. During the Middle Ages, the clergy tended to pay little attention to such superstition, seeing it as unchristian. Yet going into the early modern era, both Catholic and Protestant churches changed their attitude. Christian scholars now considered lycanthropy a foul curse acquired through demonic possession or witchcraft. 
Ironically, part of the reason for this change lay in the printing press, which made it possible to spread lore like never before and present such beliefs as fact. This time coincided with the infamous witch hunts, in which tens of thousands of women were executed on suspicion of performing black magic. Many early modern clergy believed that witches created werewolves, so it is not surprising that tens of thousands more people also faced accusations of lycanthropy. Thousands would die by hanging or burning at the stake for their supposed crimes as werewolves. Clergy at the time associated lycanthropy with a host of other abominations, including cannibalism, incest, and Satanism, much the same as witchery. As the written word continued to spread, werewolf lore slowly lost its localized character, and certain features that we can recognize emerged. Most notably, silver became the means to dispatch a werewolf across Europe, in part because many Catholic churches used that precious metal to make chalices. Yet this modern werewolf would not haunt Europe for long. With the advent of the Enlightenment, a time when intellectuals pushed back against medieval dogmas and superstitions, the werewolf found his greatest enemy, skepticism. Going into the 19th century, Europeans increasingly relegated these fearsome creatures to the Gothic novel, which further established our modern ideas about shape-shifting monsters. Werewolf lore found its way into books, television series, and even film franchises during the 20th century. So once more, the werewolf has changed and adapted. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.